This week on Time Trumpet, we catch up with an increasingly odd Tom Cruise. I've got three of these. I, I have to wind them every morning or else time will stop. We look at the high-tech remake of Last of the Summer Wine. That's it, little waitress's uniform, then you lovely little bit of crap. Oh! Put your foot down, Melbourne! And we trace the royal family's decline in popularity. Even the army lost respect for them. A the laugh trooping of the colour. Most of them who turned up just wore tracksuits. It's 2031, when cars work off nuclear power and mostly work. One of the biggest accidents in the first decade of the 21st century was when a massive swarm of bees got into the BBC's computer systems. At first, of course, everyone thought there was something wrong with their own TV, especially because the newsreaders refused to acknowledge it. First, there was a summary of the day's news, and the main news came this evening. I think they came in through an outside broadcast wire. They were there for a month. So I do what I'm told. I think a good day for the outsiders to uh, so to Once the bees got into the BBC's central computer, there was an enormous mix-up at Television Centre's studios. You fancy some coffee? Oh, not for me. I can't stomach it at the moment. What are then? What are we? No. <laughs> OK, <laughs> back in a bit. All right. Pay dispute broke up tonight without agreement. Royal Mail managers say their payoff of 14.5% over 18 months is incredibly good. The union... Here you are. Thank you. June the 12th, 2018, the coronation day of King Charles. There's King Charles with his wife. Very few members of the public bother to come and watch. You can imagine all the preparation that goes into a day like today. Even most of the army didn't turn up. The full glory of the sovereign's escort. This confirmed a disrespect for the royal family that had been going on for decades. Oh, in the end, it, it was pathetic. I mean, you see Charles on the bus and... The people flicking at his ears and saying, what are you going to do about it? I mean, they were on a walkabout one day and they got pelted with chicken shit. I mean, that wouldn't have happened ten years ago, would it? The real wake-up call, from my point of view, was, uh, was going on Parkinson. And uh, no, I thought, I thought it would be this sort of friendly chat, you know, you're a bit of a Jack the Lad, I'm a northern bloke. And he, um, he opened up with, don't you think you're a bit of an anachronism in the 21st century? Right. Anyway, I, well, I, I, mean, I, I smiled and, and laughed because, um, because I thought uh, anachronism was a, a good thing. Only last week, actually, I went up for a commercial casting and I was sitting right next to Prince William. And that's the third time. And then George Clooney uh, came on and, and I thought, again, that would be a, you know, a fun time. We'd end up at some casino, pick up some models and end up at Buck's house, you know, a bit of a champagne breakfast hangover cure. And uh, under the, the applause, he, um, he says to me, you fucking piece of shit. Well, anyway, I, I thought this was maybe some sort of cool jargon from Ocean's 20s. So I said, cheers, George. And, uh, and, and uh, went to clink fist with him like a man of African descent. And, uh, and then uh, Dame Judi Dench uh, came on and called me a wanker. Uh, because I'd made a joke about scousers and AIDS. The real trouble can be dated back to 2010 and the funeral of Princess Michael of Kent. Prince Harry, for a laugh, had placed a remote control fart machine in her coffin. Did you not yeah. think that it would cause controversy? No, I think it's what the old girl would wanted, you know. She used to pipe them out like a Mexican donkey. I personally, and I'm not alone in this, think the fart machine was inappropriate. I mean, the Archbishop of Canterbury was doing his address and you could hear these farts going off. And then, of course, you know, when everyone realised that it was coming from the coffin, Archbishop Rowan Williams runs over, tries to retrieve the little machine. But as he was bending over, he actually, you know, farted himself. And that just set everyone off again, so. Well, to my surprise, the Queen laughed. She's a person of far more humour and even subversive humour than she's credited with. <laughs> Royalty isn't something you're born into. You have to earn that position of respect. It's not just... No. No, you are born into it. What he had to understand is that royalty is something that you're born into. Yeah. You don't have to earn that respect. 2011 saw major changes in the way we shopped. 
All electronic equipment was given away free with newspapers, while everything else was bought at Tesco's. Now, I was mentioning Tesco earlier on because Tesco always in the news these days. By 2012, Tesco's had a superstore in every square mile in Britain. Tesco were brokering world heavyweight bouts, representing entertainment stars. They were making most of the films that were being made. Tesco's slogan changed from um, every little helps to uh, we control every aspect of your lives. Soon, Tesco's got planning permission to build anywhere in the country, even on the side of a cliff. By then, Britain was fully saturated with Tesco's and the supermarket chain concluded it would have to look elsewhere for domination. And then there was the war with Denmark. It started, of course, because Tesco needed room to expand. For a long time, they'd yearned to create a super state, which was, well, the first retail country. At noon on January the 21st, 2013, Tesco's invaded Denmark with 200 superstores and one and a half thousand Tesco Expresses. The Tesco thing was a shock, because, because I quite like the Danes. A couple of my occasional fucks are Danes. The Danes are a proud people. They're of Viking stock. What they want is to rape and pillage, to set fire to long ships. They don't want to be walking around a supermarket and seeing Nuts magazine at the checkout next to some chewing gum and a hairnet. That's not what the Vikings want. The war between Tesco's and Denmark lasted just five hours. This is all that remains of Copenhagen. Later in Time Trumpet, we'll be catching up with an increasingly odd Tom Cruise. I'm widely traveled. No, I, I've, I've visited all 15 of the inner planets of the galaxy. Uh, I often go dressed as John Voight, uh, just to blend in. People in other galaxies uh, seem to like to dress as John Voight. But first, special effects. Do you think you'll be kind to my bicycle? Oh, stop worrying. I'll get it back for you. I'll commandeer this vehicle. <laughs> A trilby. It was being driven by a trilby. I'm not the most technically minded person, so the idea of getting digital television gave me the heebie-jeebies. But in 2005, it was the special effects used in the BBC's digital campaign that provoked a storm of complaints. And what a surprise that was. I mean, I mean, they were real heads. Yes. And when they, I mean, they found 2,000 headless corpses. Apparently this animator had sort of gone crazy. He dug straight down, it was about half a mile deep, just full of, full of bodies. Over the last 25, 30 years, we've gone from, you know, five terrestrial channels to literally hundreds of channels available to everyone. The great thing about that is that everyone, whatever their taste, would have a programme that that catered for them. <laughs> Water everywhere, <laughs> and every drop is pink. <laughs> I, was, I was pounding the back door. Ghosts are drawn to hose pipes mm. because in limbo, it can be quite parching. Oh, right. Some people are sexually aroused by the idea of violence of a sexual nature mm. being carried out against primates. I'm not. Mm. I'm not, but some people are, and that's, it was good that a programme existed for those people. And by 2010, this show dominated the ratings. You'd say, I'm sorry, I can't come out, rape an ape is on. Whoa, 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 whoa. And that happened every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Hey, hey, oh, hey, 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 hey. One catchphrase was, push your finger in. Hook his nose. Slow down, you're wearing him out. Hang on tight, he's going to throw you off. <laughs> and when I saw it, I felt physically sick. But then when I thought about it after, I thought little bits of it made me crack up laughing. And of course now, it's, it's a classic. <laughs> I didn't like it, but I wouldn't stop. So as long as the ape wasn't hurt, or if it was hurt, as long as there was some medical help for it afterwards, and it had given its consent or appeared to. I'm done, you want to have a go? You can tell by his eyes he wants it. 
Oh, look, look, he's smiling, he's smiling. She's smiling. It was like one of those things like the archers or something, perhaps in the old days, you know, you think, oh, there's rape and rape, it's that time of day again, and all that kind of thing. It was sort of quite homely. Yeah. It's probably the homeliest rape-based theme tune I can think of. Rape and ape. Rape and ape, rape and ape. Rape and ape. Who's gonna be in the costume? Who's gonna be in the costume? Up the bum. Rape, rape, rape and ape, rape and ape. Rape, 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 rape. Uh, 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 rape and ape. Rape. But it's one of those things, everyone was singing it. I mean, I was one of the few people who actually felt slightly uncomfortable with the rape element. I mean, I loved the makeover, I loved the sketches. It was, it was just the end rape. While the public reveled in classic entertainment, its interest in the royal family steadily diminished. No one would stand up for them during the national anthem. And frequently their processions got clogged up in traffic because motorists simply couldn't be bothered pulling over. One of the warning signs was when the BBC played the Queen's speech at double speed so they could show the whole of Chicken Little. Nicholas Witchell was replaced by an animatronic waxwork outside Buckingham Palace just to convince the royals the BBC was still covering them. For relations with the BBC collapsed entirely after this disrespectful broadcast. Citizens of Zaxor Prime, silent now, awaiting the arrival of Baritania, mother ruler of the Twelve, who will emerge presently from the entrance to the halls of Yanthrakar. A Dubolian there, the second, lower head, capable of emitting a vaporizing ray if threatened. The nine heads of Nuftaqued Unitard, the leader of the Metazeroid phalanx, said to be the most ruthless yet honorable destroyers of small to medium sized worlds in the quadrant. And here is the mother ruler now, beside her sublord Utilax, followed by Secretary Masfart, Super Commander Deck Laser, and the other dignitaries of the Hyper Quadrant. A difficult year, of course, for the Mother Ruler, having been forced to give up control over the planets of Radox, Fenjal, and Badadas by the Kiltrons, themselves understandably absent from the ceremony this Yaren. This was the last major royal occasion that people turned out to watch. And while absolutely no one came to King Charles's coronation, millions flocked to Paul Burrell's newly opened Diana theme park. The Diana theme park was a way of keeping her memory alive. Um, the profits are incidental. I don't know <laughs> what they are beyond that I need never work again. He came in for a lot of stick for the Diana fun park, didn't he? Yeah, because he was saying that it was all about honouring her memory, but while he was saying it, he was actually charging people five pounds to hear him say the words. So they had so many attractions there. There was the Angolan landmine log ride. There was um, a cry for help bumper cars, wasn't there? Yes. The crash coaster. The queen of go-karts. Bulimia nervosa big dipper, wasn't there? Yeah. There was even a bungee jump attraction called Her Royal Highness. The idea is that you float through the journey of Diana's public life on lovely, bubbly water. It starts in 1970. Beneath us, the water is giggly, highly pumped, and transparent. And we enter the 1980s. There's the ramp of famousness. Slide down that. Princess Diana is not something that be, should be commemorated by a roller coaster. You know, no. it's true that she went fast and she could go high and she could go down mm -hmm. and that you might feel sick after you'd ridden her. Mm -hmm. But those are where the similarities end. We then enter the tunnel of marriage. Quite scary, this. It's um, haunting images. Prince of Wales, a younger Prince of Wales, looming over us in pyjamas. One of the rides was a DNA test to see if you were James Hewitt's son. Apparently, a lot of people were. Hello. We're the Hartigan brothers. And... Oh, dear. Sorry, I just said who we were. Whenever I go anywhere, 
I never, never say who I am because you get treated differently. Okay, cool. Um, hello. Hello. Uh, we're the Beverly Sisters. What's your background? Well, in 1998, we started up a software company that we're a trio that had a number of hits in the late 50s and early 60s. Um, we were recently awarded uh, an MBE. That's a good answer. And we're here today because we're looking for a fourth member. We'll offer up 25% of the group for £100,000. I'd be prepared to offer you 100000 for 40%. I will do the 100000 for 25%. Uh, can you sing? Yeah. Welcome to the band. There's a rehearsal on Friday. Well done, great. Good investment. Well done, guys. Well done. Thank you. Cheers. By 2013, the BBC's campaign to persuade everyone to buy a digital telly was even more controversial than the last one. Oi, tip face, it's me, Denny Digit. Don't look at me like that, I'll fucking kill you. Why haven't you switched over to digital yet? We've told you about 500 fucking times. What is it, too hard to understand? If your telly's old, you've got to buy a new one. Otherwise, no more telly. Comprehendy, granddad. And if you've already got a digital telly, don't get too smug, because we're going to switch to high def in a few years, and then you'll have to get one of them and all. And then after that, it's going to be fucking holograms, so you'll need an hologram machine, and after that, it's going to go into your fucking mind. So you'll have to get a special operation if you want to carry on watching fucking EastEnders, you cunt. All right, so don't say we didn't tell you. The most popular satellite show was a Polish soap opera. To przez Kinga. It was so popular at the time, a lot of people throughout Europe learned Polish in order to understand it. However, for the benefit of time trumpet viewers, we've hired some voiceover actors to revoice it in English. Remember, you're a great writer and it's a great book. I'm just a bit nervous. Don't be nervous. Remember what the doctor said. You're normal. I'm normal, just like everybody else. That's what he said, wasn't it? Oh, hang on. There's a really very attractive man. I have to talk to him now. OK, wish me luck in a good-luck way. Mm. Hello. Hello. I'm Sean. I'm the publisher. Uh, I publish things. Oh, you're the publisher. <laughs> yes, I'm the publisher. Sean, let's hang. Sean, do you have a second? I, I photocopied my bottom. I can't publish this. I'll do a better copy. Take a seat. Thanks. Now, what's your name again? Deirdre Costigan. Deirdre. Unusual. French? No, Athlone. Sorry about my secretary, by the way. She's absolutely useless. Jackie, you're useless. Hello. Will you send in two coffees? Uh, coffee, that's the uh, dark one, isn't it? Yeah, and send a bit of sugar as well. Uh, now, Deirdre, before we start, <clears throat> do you like my desk? Yes, yes, I do. So do I. <laughs> I'd really appreciate it if you'd just touch it for me. Mm, yeah. It's worth a fortune, so it is. Um, your script is brutal, love, and I'm not going to publish it, and neither is anyone else in it alone, in my opinion, and I make no apologies. Uh, you can't write, you haven't done your research, and you don't know your subject. All mechanics in Athlone are crooked, we know that, but you've got to give me proof if I'm to, you know, publish and make some money to go on holidays. Mm. Now... Coffee in cups. Thank you very much. I made it quick, didn't I? Did you remember to boil the water first, Jackie? Nah, you must be mental. Mm. I don't take sugar usually. Even one spoon, I go all. The doctor told me I shouldn't really take. Oh, well, there you go. That's a table wreck now, destroyed. I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm normal. I have hankies. I'm a lady. I have hankies, but I'm a publisher. Such was the popularity of Paul Burrell's Diana theme park that he opened another 50 of them the following year. He went in and there was a museum of all the things of Princess Diana's that um, Paul Burrell had collected. You know, there were plates and crowns and her first fried egg was there. It had gone off a bit now, but you could still see what it would have been like. There's an AIDS patient uh, wandering around you can touch. The royals were being forgotten. 
Of the millions who flocked to the Diana theme parks, polls revealed nearly 70% of them didn't even know she'd once been a royal. 90% of them thought she'd been married to Paul Burrell. The royals were in crisis. They faced disrespect from the public. My mother, you know, famously once said she wanted to be known as um, the Queen of Hearts when I'd been dubbed uh, Prince of Farts, which actually doesn't sound that dissimilar. King Charles ordered a referendum on who should rule Britain. He stood, as did Helen Mirren. As the opinion polls came out in the lead-up, showing they were stuffed, they started to panic. They arranged photo shoots of them eating fish and chips with builders. The royal calendar was... There were pictures like Charles giving a piggyback to one of the royal dogs. William learnt the Peter Crouch dance, which no one remembered by then. Everyone thought he was having a seizure and was too ill to be king. Exit polls showed Mirren was ahead. I do remember saying to, to Wills, I said, don't the army swear an oath to us? Couldn't we get them to shoot all the people who voted for Mirren? And uh, he said, not sure. Let me look into it. Next thing I know, the stupid shit's emigrated to Monaco. Peter. David, what a three-way battle this is. Quite extraordinary. Here's our But the result was a shock. A majority had written an extra name on the ballot paper and voted for the memory of Diana. So now all royal palaces lie empty in her memory. The royal family are occasionally seen processing for their own amusement, which they do in the middle of the night. Meanwhile, Prince Harry was allowed to keep his title, but he was now officially memorabilia. My mother, you know, she used to say to me, she used to say, you know, the longest word in the English language is smiles. Yeah. Because there's a, there's a mile, you see, between the, um, the first and the last S. What I did, I did out of loyalty to Diana, according to her wishes. Her wishes, as I imagined, she would have expressed them were she to be alive and consulted on certain issues. There's a certain amount of supposition there, but based on facts as I choose to see them. But what about Rape and Ape? By its fifth season, the show was losing viewers to a much better entertainment programme. Ross Kemp on fire. What was all that about? Well, it was, what? It was about setting light to Ross Kemp. I know, brilliant. I think Grant would have done well here anyway. Grant would have loved it. Originally it was supposed to be Kemp in water, with Kemp in various water states, seas, lakes, rivers, lodge puddle in a car park, but it was a health and safety nightmare. You might have shot a few more things than I've shot, but that's only different, isn't it? I mean, the worst of it were just the quips, which just became interminable, you know. What a hot show we've got. Who the blazes are my guest. I'm Ross Kemp and I'm on fire, which is just a fact. The first time I saw it, I thought, where does this go as a series? But it just got better and better. Since getting celebrities to do dangerous things was the future, the makers of Rape and Ape decided put famous people like Chris Moyles in an ape suit for Rape a Celebrity Ape. Oh. Julio Iglesias was in it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he was... Uh, he, he didn't look pleased. I loved the way Ricky Gervais just kept that dance going um, for a long time, but it did anger the others in the cage. I don't think he ever danced since, has he, really? Were you ever invited onto it? No, I was never invited onto it. I'd like to have been. All those great big hairy men putting their paws all over me. I, you know, it went on an awfully long time, so I think it was a bit of an insult. Don't you, that they didn't ask me? Yes. The Chris Moores is the one that always gets talked about. Speaking ten years ago on Darts at Stars, Chris Moyles gave his own account of this celebrity abuse. I mean, I was expecting it was going to be like the Buzzcocks, you know, where they give you all the answers and then you know what's going to happen. But no, none of that. I mean, uh, I was expecting to be given a bit of lube, uh, uh, be told where to stand, given a couple of lines to say, instead of which I was straight in there. There are people that like to see sexual violence happening to apes, but not necessarily apes which then have the face of Chris Moyles. That's... There's a line in the sand and that programme crossed it. Mm. Yes, but they, the producers at the time, said the fault wasn't having celebrities. The fault was merely that one of the celebrities was Chris Moyles. Yeah. <laughs> when someone like Michael Fish dies of anal trauma in a hospital ward, you do think as good 
as that was, should I be watching this? I mean, yes, because I need to take the pulse of the nation. By all means, make television about Chris Moyles, make jokes about Chris Moyles, but you have to understand that the significance of the image of Chris Moyles to various people, and it isn't always something that we can understand as people who don't attach any importance to him. Mm. Now, this is all very well in that it says a lot of significant things about taste, about taboos, about what is acceptable and not on television. Mm. But ideally for this show, uh, and we've been asking everyone to do this, could you just sing the theme tune to Rape and Ape? Oh, Rape and Ape, Rape and Ape, Rape and Ape. And then the verse. I can't remember the verse. It was something like, down in the jungle where the celebrities go, there is an ape and he doesn't know What's in store for him tonight? He's gonna get a terrible fright. Next week in Time Trumpet, the war in Iraq. He's got his hand up as if to say, taxi! And I wouldn't have stopped at Baghdad, no sorry. We would have gone straight to Moscow. But well, there's no taxi coming to pick up this bastard. Donna and Ben show they could manage these machine moves, but no. Plus, we catch up with the man who shot Noddy Holder. I never wanted to, to kill him. Just, just hurt him. <laughs> <laughs>